Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, unexplained absences. My name is Felix Schultz. And I'm Andy Green. Where were you last week? Where was I? Where were you? What was your excuse? I was here waiting. You just turned up and I never I never showed I stood you up. <laughs> uh no, in all seriousness, we took the week off. Yeah, we did. Well yeah. deserved break, I think, Felix. You had a bit going on. Yeah, I was moving house. You had a bit going on. Uh, yeah, I always have a bit going on. You moved house, you now have a, uh, a turret for an office. Yeah. No more, don't disclose any more lo- information because once you include turret, it nails down the location significantly. I'm just, I mean, I could make jokes. No, that's it's too soon to make jokes about turrets. And <laughs> nearly vacant houses. Security risk, security risk for you. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, this week we are chatting to... The lovely, charming uh, Niha Bajpai, former colleague, sometime boss, and current media director of Risk Check, Andy. So, former and current colleague. Well, uh, she's uh, we. I, I met through Revolution, and she. Uh, I've done writing for Risk Check, and continue to sort of do the occasional piece there. So, I don't know. Maybe we just say it's a small world, the world of watches. Um, it is. It is, and it, it is quite a nice relationship you have with with Neha, and it's sort of you got to be careful, don't you? Because you never know when an ex colleague is going to become your boss. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's you know, and and uh, well, there's also one degree of separation with you. You know, uh, she's written for ACM, and you know, it's all it's all very it's all very uh, intertangled. Mm, very well versed. Uh, it was an interesting chat. I personally quite liked how we. Um, we learnt more about the Indian watch scene, something I'd not really yeah, thought about. I've, yeah, it's one of those, it, when it pops off, it's got to pop off. Probably already has. Sounds pretty big. Sure. Um, speaking of uh, wrist check, I've actually been spending a bit of my time recently writing something for them. What have you been writing? I've been writing about video games um, oh. and watches. Video it's- games and watches. Uh Something we talked about years ago. What's what's been happening in the the years since? Uh, it's, I mean, it's it's more of a, a summary of everything you know. But it did. One of the things that people always do forget about is that the gaming industry, like, far eclipses the American movie and music industry. So, in terms of like revenue and scale, like by a, a significant margin. Um, yeah, I've spent more money on video games this year than I have watches. Wow, that's wow. <laughs> either, either you've bought every single game released or you've not bought any watches. I actually don't think I've bought a watch this year, Felix. <gasps> Shooketh, shooketh. Um, but one thing that this this story did get me into, it's it's quite. A, I'll, I'll, I'm not sure if it will be published by the time this goes up, maybe not, so I won't spoil it too much. But let's just say that I spent a lot of time listening to the Nintendo 64 classic GoldenEye pause music. Oh yeah. Do you ever play oh, GoldenEye? Yeah. Oh, of course. Nintendo sixty four was a, a favorite in the household. What's do you remember what the pause menu was? Mm, not off the top of my head. It's it was a watch. It was James Bond's watch. What you That's for. right. That's right. Not not branded though. What was it? A uh, a mega? It looked like it. It look, it's it's like a sort of nineties polygon version of an SMP. It's like the helium escape valve and like the bezel and the, even the bracelet, like the five link bracelet's pretty recognizable, but even um, in uh, so few pixels. Yeah, no, no branding on there. You know, um, you can't help but think that uh, Jean Claude Biver, who put that deal together, maybe uh, didn't consider how important the game would be. Actually, to be fair, I've, I've subsequently learned that no one realized how big that game would be. No, no, no. You've, um, you've been playing around with other, other, yeah. Yeah, I've been tools. doing. Um, I sent you. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you some other ones I've been doing, but I sent you uh, a portrait I created um, using the AI art bot Mid Journey. Um, of my prompt was something I'm trying to remember what the the sort of the command prompt was. Ben Clymer selling Rolex watches out of a <laughs> trench coat, and what did it return? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing particularly great. Like I'm trying, I wasn't trying to pick on Ben Clover, but I was like, I know it. It sort of goes off faces, but I don't think anyone in the watch industry has a kind of Google image supremacy as say, like if if I typed, I don't know, like Chris Hemsworth, maybe I should do like Chris Hemsworth wearing a tag Hoyer and see what it comes up with. 
You should do a, a podcast about watches. Let's see what comes up. Oh. We farm out this whole podcast to AI, you think? Is it yeah, is the tech I, there? Honestly, let's let's we don't need to ask people for their um maybe I'll just sort of like AI bot, you know, profile of Neha Bajpai wearing watch and just we'll put that up as the show assets. I'm I'm thinking we get a whole generated interview. That's a different tap out entirely. Uh, I love it. Well, I've also been uh, been doing things, Felix. What have you been up to? I playing a game, playing uh, Horizon Forbidden West, PlayStation Five. I know it's it's been out for a Mm, hot minute, I think like six months, seven months, the whole year, basically. Are you going to buy the uh, Lego set? Yeah, for sure. I I didn't love the first one, but I didn't give it the time. I just couldn't at the time when I started playing. I couldn't give it the commitment that it needed. I still can't, but I'm, I'm more open to the the time commitment and the suck that it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, sure. I've got to get on the PlayStation. There's just things missing in my life that I'm like, oh, I do that. Oh, it's PlayStation only. Oh, it's you need a, you need one. You you need one for your uh, turret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I got I got nothing else there. Yeah, well, nothing. Well, yep. other things we need. So. Games aside, mm. we we caught up for the first time in quite some time. We went into the city and we saw the new, uh, well, the 2022 release novelty from Tag Heuer, the Plasma. The incredible uh, Tag Heuer Carrera Plasma to be on something, something. A lot going on there. So diamond encrusted case style crown is made from diamond. Lab grown got, diamonds. Lab grown. That's the twist here. So uh, anodized aluminium case. Mm-hmm. Diamonds are set into it. They're lab grown, as is the dial. From what we understand, the dial is a sheet of yeah. like grown diamond diamonds. Single that they di- cut. Technically, it's a single diamond. It's crazy, crazy. Uh, really small production run. I'm not sure we can say how many. I, I, it's not limited, but it's going to be like like any high jewelry piece. They only make a few a year. Yeah, high price point. Uh, have to kind of be an existing VIP, I think, to kind of even be considered, but a really interesting take. I mean, I haven't really seen too much lab-grown diamonds. It comes at an interesting time in the mm. world, I think, for diamonds in general, but I'm not anti-lab-grown. I yeah. think, why not? Uh, and I didn't realise how long they took to grow. Yeah, they're not. It's not like... Uh, pop them in uh, overnight. And- rosemary. It doesn't just yeah, <laughs> it's, it doesn't just pop up. It takes uh, like 18 months, two years or something. Some of them, I think they were talking like years of growing. Uh, quick question. What was mm. your biggest takeaway on that uh, watch? Like the one thing that you're like, wow. I That I can't tell the difference between lab-grown and regular diamonds and also learning that lab-grown uh, tend to be a bit of clarity because, you know. F- for me, uh, it was the dial. Like you know, the, everything else is really impressive. Like the the, the crown, mm. the the baguette setting in the in the case was really impressive. But that dial, I think, has real potential. Like, surely that wouldn't be. You'd grow a giant sheet of it. You'd cut it. You know, and yeah, I find that interesting because lab grown t- typically they say it's about a third of the price. Mm. So obviously, figuring out how to grow diamonds in a sheet like that, I'm not sure if other people have done it before. Or if Tag Heuer, you know, kind of figured it out for themselves, and there's a high cost, but. I would have thought that you would be able to use that tech at some point for a diamond dial that is still, you know, that's a third of price, yeah. third of the price. Yeah. So it might be three grand instead of ten or whatever it is. Yeah. For, for and it does like it. It gives a really good impression of like a, it. It looks from a distance, and you know, I'm not trying to say it's you know pretending to be, but it looks like a fully set parve or snow set dial. It, I think it kind of looks a bit better than that. Appeal. I think it's got a. Yeah, it's an in, it's a really interesting, yeah, uh, organic kind mm. of vibe to it. Mm. Hey, you know what else is interesting and perhaps organic, Andy? Uh, if you don't wash it, you know, you're talking about your atom strap. <laughs> I'm sure there's some organic ingredients somewhere in there. Um, atom straps, Andy. What atom strap have you been jonesing after uh, lately? It's it for me. It's just a straight up NATO. Admiralty blue, uh, navy, super comfortable. I really like Artem, mostly because of the the softness and the sheen. That sort of seat belty, I think, mm. yeah, seat belty vibe. Mm. It's a little bit classier than your typical NATO that you know frays really easily and is a bit kind of meh, organic. Also, um, I've had other sort of seat belty ones, and this is, I mean, maybe getting too deep in the weeds of you know fabric finishing. 
I've had other sort of glossy NATOs that have been slippery and the watch has like slipped around on them. Not with this one. No. It's got no, an no, no. extra thickness. It's luxurious. It is a really nice NATO. You know, I had a mate just get a, uh, a bit of an off topic, but he just got his first Omega Speedmaster. Classic. Pro. Put you it know, on big NATO. One. 40th birthday present, big one for him. Yep. He said, Andy, where do I start for NATO straps? Oh, Adam.straps on Instagram or Adam.straps.com. I've got you. I have you. I, this is sorted. This is a sailcloth. He lives by the beach. Bang, sailcloth. You want to work? He, uh, he owns a mechanic shop. Bang, on the NATO, you'll be fine. No worries. Incredible. It's, it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. Adam.straps on Instagram if you want to get some inspiration for your next strap. I love it, Andy. Uh, you know what else I love? Uh, I hope you're about to say me. Uh, I was I was going to say talking about watches with interesting guests, but oh, I, can, so. I can also say Andy if that's the polar opposite of me. <laughs> uh, we've got we've got Neha. Neha's ready to let's get it on, on the line. Let's do it. Today's guest is uh, Neha Bajpai, who has been writing about watches for over a decade. Uh, she started at Watch Time India. Then we I briefly worked with her at Revolution, where she was. Great, to be honest. Uh, these days, she is the media director uh, at Risk Check, where I still get to work with her occasionally, which is still great. Welcome to OT, Nia. How are you? Thank you, Felix. And hi, Andy. Thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, it's always lovely to chat with you, Felix. So this is more like our, our WhatsApp chat, but with voice call. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, whatever you need to ask and whatever I have to say. Let's Let's roll it i think i think this chat is probably a lot more um safe not 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 safe for work but this is a lot less um <laughs> this will be a lot more sanitized than our uh, okay. whatsapp chat speaking of social media platforms owned by the facebook group i saw on your instagram some shots videos of one of the more exciting watches of 2022 the moses streamliner vanta black tourbillon how is it? So I am actually about to start crowdfunding for that because I don't have a million <laughs> Hong Kong dollars to buy one. But if I had to buy one Moser so far, that would be the one. And why so? Because you've really, I mean, I can't explain it um, in words, although that's that's my profession. But you really have to try it on to see how glamorous that piece is and glamorous in a very sophisticated way it doesn't it's gold and black which can be tacky um mm. in if some other brands try it but this is moser it's understated and they have just glammed up the whole quotient for streamliner which i love uh, i especially love the integrated bracelet in red gold so yeah it's like 10 on 10 it's um it it certainly looks good and it's sort of been interesting to see how they've taken the direction of the streamliner. Uh, yeah. I was actually impressed that and, and surprised that Felix was was quite into it. Uh, most of it, well, he's yeah, you're a little bit cooler on on what Moses has been been doing lately, and this Not is a really, really kind of a standout piece. I think for this year as well. What did you say to me? He said if you if you drop the Torby on, you'd be all over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can I. You know, I'm not a huge fan of tourbillons in general, but I love mm. the look of the Streamliner. I think it's one of the most, for like this new trend of integrated watches mm. that everyone's doing, I think it's one of the most successful, you know, ones without a historic background. Well suited for, uh, I think, that gold colour as well. And I was I was curious of the price and obviously you've gone hands-on with it. So I think, what, a million Hong Kong is probably about <laughs> 200,000 Aussie. You take, take the tourbillon, you're going to be in maybe 100 something. Hundred and something thousand Aussie, so feel like it's possible. Well, look, we'll link up the crowdfunding, the the you know Indiegogo, the share <laughs> um, watch, in in the show notes. Uh, I'm sure we'll hit it by the end of the week. Mm, I love it. I love it. I think it's really. I think you know we, we've been talking a lot about the you know the releases of 2022, and it's you know we're in late August, early September at this point of the year, and there's sort of not been that many exciting releases. So I don't know necessarily that anyone was sort of expecting it, and it's and it's good that it's it's come from a brand from. Um, a brand like Moser. Uh, one thing, uh, you know, I noticed an article you've written lately. It was sort of, it was called The Rise of Women Watch Collectors at Auctions. Right. Now, can you tell me about the rise of, you know, women watch collectors at auctions? Okay. So this was like, this came out of another chat from, uh, with, with a friend at Philips, um, Arthur. And uh, he just mentioned that he's been like working on 
some analytics and they've seen this rise in numbers of women who are coming out and participating in live auctions. And, mm-hmm. and I, I, I got really curious. It took us a few months to like really put a number to it, which I wouldn't say is uh, super exciting. Uh, it's not double di- in double dig- digits, but yeah, we are seeing a change. And um, as I mentioned in my story, that's that a large part of it is due to how um, watch enthusiasts, both men and women, got together talking about watches during pandemic. So the pandemic really did good for the collecting community, the brands and, you know, every everyone in general in this business. And that's when these women, you know, from different corners of the world started to talk about it. They were always like, really, um, there, there was this inhibition of, oh, what am I going to say in a gathering of very well-established collectors? Oh, I'll just go as a plus one with my husband or with my partner. I'll just watch, but I do love watches. But so now it's graduated from I'll I'll just be a plus one or I'll be the quiet one in the room too. I'm going to um, drive the discussion. I have questions. And when they meet um, in these uh, 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 specific groups, which have only women, the discussion gets even more animated because there, there are no inhibitions. Nobody's judging each other. And it's I'm, I was told that it's easier to deal with, uh, you know, women auctioneers and collect women uh, dealers like Zoe Abelson. So I think the landscape is going under change and um, it's, it's lovely to see that. And is that something, I know you were talking, you know, with Arthur at Phillips about that. Is that something that you see or have any awareness of, being reflected uh, at risk check like there's a risk check uh, I would again say it's a very very small percentage but yeah it is there and um, I, I've had the pl- pleasure of talking to Lang Lang who is a uh, kind of uh, one of the most well-known collectors from Asia specifically mm. Hang- Hong Kong and uh, she mentioned that she is still not as comfortable as at, at, at auctions as she is in uh, you know spaces like risk check where she can come in uh, take her own sweet time to look at pieces discuss it with our specialists and then you know uh, ruminate over her next buy. So ha- auctions are still a bit more hushed, uh, rushed for yeah. her. And um, she, she, she still feels that she's a bit alienated in a room full of men um, when she goes to auctions. But spaces like risk check, like at our store, we have a very nice lounge. We make people comfortable. There's a gaming console. You can get your wine. Um, chat with us and it, it's very easy it's very easy going so it's it caters to you know uh, those in their 30s who are just starting out um, uh, buying watches and probably they don't know much but they want to know more and they want to spend on watches so that's what that's the audience we are catering to and women yes are mm are increasingly uh, coming over to our store and asking more questions about which watch they should go for and why this and why not that. So I think it's quite encouraging. One thing that, uh, speaking about risk check and your role uh, as the person who oversees all the editorial, um, Mm -hmm. as far as I understand it, Mm -hmm. I find this is something that I've sort of come back to several times over the last year or so. I think sites that are that started off uh, as sales platforms like Risk Check and A Collected Man um, have the most interesting watch editorial at the moment, while others, I'm uh, thinking of Hodinki in particular, which mm-hmm. started off as, you know, sort of the, the best editorial and have shifted to commercial are really, I think, falling behind in the reader's perception of what their editorial output is like. So why... Are sales platforms doing the best stories about watches and why are media sites struggling to compete with it in a way? Well, thanks uh, for the compliment, uh, Felix. I think it's because of contributors like you. <laughs> and I'm so right glad. answer. Love it. <laughs> I'm so glad we have you as a contributor for RISTEC. But uh, yeah, on a more serious note, I think it's the fact that we don't have any um, 
you know, sales, marketing commitments to brands. We don't need to produce as many number of articles that pander to, you know, marketing needs. And uh, we, don't, we don't have to cover every watch launch under the sun. We choose what we want to talk about. Uh, we have the time to work on ideas that are, you know, interesting. Uh, the content is fresh, entertaining, and educational, but it, it's it's not just everything that is it's not just about everything that's being launched every month. So I think we have more time to work on our stories, which is very important. We uh, focus on what people want to read rather than what brands want to see. So I think that makes a huge difference. And yeah. Uh, this is what I have been working around, so I can yeah. I can talk about myself. And and how do you work out what people do want to read? Okay, so it also depends on. Uh, so be, recently, I've been working very closely with a marketing and sales team to understand our audience or our clients better, or our potential clients better. What what kind of watches they're interested in? What questions do they ask? What's the demographic? So around that, and obviously, uh, since I come from, uh, I have a journalistic background. It it's also about what I think would fit into that age bracket and that demographic and of course mapping out trends but i i don't have to report on everything under the sun and i'm very glad about it like at revolution it was like non-stop churning of stories one after another whether we were able to get to the depth of it or not it doesn't matter it didn't matter it was just about you know having it out there on ig first so mm. i'm i'm very glad mm. that we are out of that rat race and uh, i think that that's make that makes a huge difference when it comes to the quality of content yeah i think that's really interesting and i think you know the watches that you know risk check focuses on obviously can help kind of dictate that editorial direction as well and sort of it's um it works in harmony with each other because you don't want to be writing artic articles about you know the latest watch that you have no interest in selling and you don't want to be buying watches to sell that you have no interest in buying and selling. So it sort of nulls, um, nullifies both of both of those sides out. But um, you didn't always work at Risk Check. You mentioned Revolution. You've worked at a few places. One thing I, you know, I said as soon as Felix said, we're getting near Hull, and I said, I want to ask her about um, an article she wrote, a little article she wrote last year for a collective man. Um, you mm -hmm. made a, a guest appearance on the website. And it's called The Women Behind Cut, yeah. And it's a, I mean, a collective man, they're, famed for their you know long longer form content which i also you know i, I love and i think is there's some parallels there with risk check you know in terms of being able to kind of focus and you know invest a bit more time into proper um, journalism and, and detailed reporting this yeah. article is quite historic um i think there's a few things i want to dive into because you know you, you put so much work into it but i guess at the top line why do you think the cartier family is so legendary cartier family is legendary because of what they did at that time, um, mm. the unique design language, whether it was jewelry or it was watches, I think they were they were the pioneers in terms of if if we had to look at shape watches, they they were the pioneers uh, on that front. I'm talking more about watches and less about jewelry because I I know better about um, watches than um, the other mm -hmm. accessory. So I think, yeah, they were very, and, and the, the brothers, the way they distributed responsibilities within the family was very nicely mapped out for each of the brothers and the way they went around uh, conquering one market uh, to another. I think it, it was a, a group of things that worked very well for the brand, the way the father had every son uh, take over a particular city like mm. a, like New York, London, and Paris, and each one had you know certain roles marked out. I think it was very well planned. Plus, these women had it not been for the families these guys married into, yeah. I don't think they would have been where they are. They are, and this is what struck me when I read um, when I was going through Francesca's book. Um, I've read it twice um, mm -hmm. and um, I was one of the first few people to interview her when the book came out. 
And um, it's, it's always a pleasure to work with her. So I went back to the book while I took a break from revolution and I wanted to just, you know, just think about something different altogether. And I realized that why hasn't anyone talked about these ladies? Why hasn't anyone talked about where all this money came from and what went behind the scenes? So it was like a very obvious um, thing to uh, pick on if you read the book. Mm. And um, I pitched the idea to uh, Collected Man and they loved it. And then Francesca, uh, she is always very kind and supportive. So yeah, it took me um, around a month to get all the research in place and confirm it with Francesca and then, you know, put it together. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's one of the most interesting stories I've done in the last 15 years. Yeah, and and I mean, I agree. It's saying that it's one of the more interesting articles I've I've read yet yeah, in a in a long time. I, th- I find it sort of fascinating to kind of go through and, you know, every brand these days wants to talk about you know heritage or faux heritage and you know they nineteen fifty five they did a dive watch with this color on it and it is quite hard to kind of cut the truth from you know that bought heritage and it does seem genuinely quite mm-hmm. real with with Cartier as a brand. I mean, on a I guess from an enthusiast standpoint, how enjoyable was it for you? Did it make you connect more with the brand? Did it did it really add a lot of value um, to sort of what you saw in Cartier and sort of and and did it change how you viewed them as a you know both a, a watch maker and a jewelry house? To be very honest, I'm like I I like digging deep into uh, stories, and that's what the, that that I would say was the enjoyable part about it. I like to bring out facts which have not already been, like you know, widely reported. So in that sense, I was really excited to work on this piece. But if you're asking me how it, um, how it changed my opinion about the brand, uh, I'd say I was I was kind of sad that there's there's never been a mention about any uh, any of these women anywhere buy the brand or, you know, say something like a collection which is dedicated to one of these women or, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, mm. it's just been a very male centric luxury brand. And uh, even in, even today, like they run a, they run a campaign or I think uh, some charity pro- uh, program around women, but that's just about it. Again, it has no context to, the brand's history so mm. yeah it <laughs> to be honest to be. It, it didn't contribute to anything positive about my opinion on the brand but yeah it's just an observation and i wish they could have done more mm. well i mean it's you know you possibly know a lot more about uh, about their history than you know a lot of people that work there but it, it is it is interesting nonetheless and you know there's plenty of opportunities do you think that you know on the on the flip side of you know you kind of talk about you know a bit of a passion for researching um history and into brands is there any other brands that like really jump out to you uh on you know to the same degree of i guess interest so it's not really brand specific uh but era specific i would say so i love 1950s i loved uh i love shape watches i did a a uh, rather lengthy piece on uh, the evolution of shape watches for revolution as well, talking to uh, collectors like Ronnie Madhwani and, uh, you know, Aro and uh, uh, Nick, Nick Fox. So that's, that's the, that's the era that f- fascinates me more than, you know, say a particular brand, but obviously Cartier was um, the front runner in this um, genre so obviously yeah and then i'm uh, also very enamored with jeju lakut it's one of my um, most favorite topics uh, to talk about the history of the brand and how did they start with movement wake as a movement maker and you know how the history of reverso and yeah so these two are particularly of interest to me these are what sort of interests you as a as a writer and a researcher these these brands and these histories because they're great histories mm-hmm. does that translate to the sort of watches you like yeah of course so i have always been in love with the reverso i've i've seen um, and hundreds of watches over the last 12 15 years but that's one watch that has been consistently 
on my list of favorites and um, I think it's it's quite versatile and the fact that it started as a sports watch and graduated to being a dress watch and how they're doing all kinds of innovations within that reversible case it it continues to be my favorite uh, watch to talk about um, besides that um, yeah, I guess, as I said, I'm I'm a big huge fan of shape watches. So Cartier fascinates me a lot. 1950s uh, Patek Philippe's um, are of my interest again. So yeah, these are the watches that I'm interested in. But unfortunately, I wish I could say that I have uh, one each from these brands from that particular era. But <laughs> I, I I can't even forget about like spending my lifetime saving on buying one but i i uh, the they're so rare that i um it's hard to even you know get to see go and see them in metal forget about like having them in the safe at home yeah yeah i can uh, empathize with that like uh, there's so often you know my interest in something will just go to a nicely written story and i'll mm-hmm. never you know own own a watch from whatever it was um, you said, you know, Andy was talking about how that, that Cartier story was one of his favourites and you said it's one of the ones you're proudest of in the last, you know, 15 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have stories, because I know I do, do you have stories that are sort of half in your head that you'd like to write but you haven't worked out how or you don't think that anyone would be interested in, you know, commissioning or, or reading them? Like I'm, I'm obsessed with dial factories. Oh, okay. You're most welcome to write it for wrist check. Like. <laughs> Brief is um, coming. <laughs> will you will wrist check cover the extensive on the ground research in Switzerland? Um, I can check. I can work around it. Sounds like a yes to me. Done. Locked <laughs> in. Um, do you, Do you have anything sort of equivalent? Not really. No. I if I have something in my head, I just need to put it down. And I would say I've been very fortunate to work with. Uh, people who have given me that kind of opportunity to just, uh, you know, go ahead and, um, you know, put it down in words and research about it and take my own time to do it. So, uh, no, I don't really have any idea in mind which I haven't really worked on. So, yeah. You also have done some stuff for Watch Time India in the past. I mm-hmm. am kind of curious what the watch scene is like in India. This is a very big, big place. Um, mm-hmm. But um, what, what's a, what's the watch collecting, watch media scene like there? Um, so I launched the Indian edition of Watch Time in, in 2012. And um, my mentor was Joe Thompson, who was the editor-in-chief of the US edition then. And I worked with uh, Joe Thompson and Norma Buchanan, two of the finest journalists. So, yeah. So when we brought the magazine mm-hmm. to India, they were only, watches were seen only in, you know, those supplements that go out with your news magazines. And those, um, the ones that have a mix of jewelry and watches. Mm-hmm. So, in fact, in 2010, the news magazine I was working with decided to bring out one of one such supplement and I anchored it and then we went to Basel in 2012 and we got the license to publish watch time in India so that's how it all started and uh, I'd say that we were the only magazine in the country that was covering watches like the way we do like proper journalism around watches uh, the others were still, you know, like the supplement style, one story in a year or around the festive season. And then there were there are a couple of trade magazines, but there are no really journalistic style articles there. So I've seen, I, I would say the a scene is like, the watch scene is very nascent there, but that uh, watch journalism scene is very nascent there. But I, I'd say that we have quite a few collectors who are like, uh, very well established. They know what they want. They know the brands. They know much more than most journalists do about watches. Uh, but unfortunately, the retail scene in the country is such with the import taxes and the retail environment is not ideal. So watches are being bought outside of India, mm. say Dubai, 
um, Hong Kong or, you know, London, uh, Singapore, instead of uh, being bought within the country. So I just hope that 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 gets better in the coming years, more watch brands um, come into the market and they have a decent budget, marketing budget to spend, invest within the country. And I think it has great potential because people have the money. It's just about um, uh, A, educating them about uh, brands other than Rolex, Omega, Breguet, and uh, Cartier and uh, um, also about the right retail environment. So I think it has great potential, but currently there are a number of things that have kind of marked the growth of the market in that sense. Yeah, I, my um, perception is as well, like I, I've often heard that it is uh, a watch buying community that buys out of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember talking to to Hublot people, like they were very excited about, you know, I think they've got some cricket sponsorships mm. over there and in Australia we've we've had Michael Clark as a um, uh, the local sort of Hublot ambassador and that's something that tracks really well. So I think they're one of the brands that's, I think, being quite proactive there, which is unsurprising really because they're always, you know, sort of first on the marketing front. Mm-hmm. Dublo is uh, quite big there. In fact, uh, for Watch Time, we run we ran a campaign with Dublo, a contest on um, Watch Time's IG, where the winner got tickets to the World Cup finals, which were um, the ICC Cricket World Cup finals, uh, and uh, yeah, so that was one big collab that we got done at uh, watch time so huge cricket buffs and you blow tag warrior I, I i would say the lv image brands have shown great faith in the market richmond not not as much and uh, the market leader there in the super premium category is Breguet. They, really? been, yeah and they've been around for very many years i think since the 90s the swatch was one of the first groups Swatch Group was one of the first um, luxury watch conglomerates to uh, open their headquarters in India, and they've been uh, doing a great job. Wow. And, and obviously, Breguet has benefited from that first mover advantage. What do you think influences the tastes? And, and you know, you kind of called out those brands, like especially the LVMH, which, which might be a bit more you know, bigger and, and colourful designs, to put it you know, very, very simply. Um, is it the sort of... Because I know there's a very passionate um, sporting culture. Is it mm-hmm. is is that what sort of drives consumer taste? Is it you know social media? Is it uh, something I don't know about? Is it just marketing? But I'm curious, like what 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 the actual when you get down to the scene, what the the tastes are like. So for a for a, a sophisticated collector who is like graduated from your Rolexes and Omegas, it is more about the indies nowadays mm-hmm. so moser um have came to india in 2018 and 2017 2018 and it's one of the more established indies uh in the indian market i would say so those those collectors are now uh into um experimenting with brands other than your usual um, Swatch, Rishmo, and LV Image. But the mass, uh, if you talk about uh, number of sales and people buying in terms of um, number of watches being sold per, as per groups, then I think those category of people are influenced by brand ambassadors. So you'll see that Longines had Ishwarya Rai. Yep. Um, Long time. Yeah, and Tiso had Deepika Padukone, who is now with uh, Louis Vuitton globally. Um, Virat Kohli, the Indian uh, cricket team's captain, was uh, again uh, the brand ambassador for Tiso for some time. Uh, Panerai had um, um, MS Dhoni, again a cricketer. So it's it's a it's a lot of uh, a lot of these sales are you know driven by who you put out as the face of the brand mm. in the market yeah yeah same as everywhere then same as everywhere yeah i was about to say <laughs> um and what neha what's happening with you know we're sort of talking about market and talking about you know the growth in in 
interest in independent watchmaking and you know that sort of push is that something that risk check is working around as well like uh, you know you've traditionally as far as i understand have been very sort of strong in you know ap rm and that space are you mm-hmm. finding more and more appetite for those you know more niche independent makers yeah uh, when we started out obviously ap's and rms were brands that we were working very closely with and i'm speaking more uh, from the editorial point of view than sales mm. uh, ap because obviously um, austin did the china edition uh, with AP and that brought him really close uh, to the brand and uh, kind of, you know, it popularized uh, AP further within his circles and uh, within that age group, you know, mid twenties, early thirties. But now, yes, we are working very closely with the Indies, especially Moser, MBNF, Orwork, Acrevia, and um, soon you'll hear uh, something very interesting coming up with another uh, indie, but uh, very new. I, I cannot reveal the name right now, but it, it's going to be a big surprise. Yeah. So we are working mm-hmm. towards that. And um, uh, it's, it's not just about sales. And that's a good part about risk check. So um, I didn't mention it earlier when we were talking about content for risk check but i'd like to mention it now that it's not sales driven and austin uh, has been very clear about it that uh, the editorial is one of the most important pillars within the company and it should be unbiased the content should be unbiased and it should be educational and um so far uh, we've been doing like we've been, been not just promoting brands that are or watches that need to be pushed out of the store or from our um, website, uh, eShop. We've been like doing what we think is interesting, uh, makes for an interesting read. So that way we are very independent. And as I said, that helps. That helps in, you know, thinking fresh idea, thinking of fresh ideas and looking at things from a different perspective than just sales. So yeah, a lot of, stuff around indies is what you're going to see at risk check zone in terms of collabs in terms of events in terms of content so i think uh, that's how it is with most um uh, publishing houses or pre-owned dealers right now uh, indies are uh, big and indies are where all the innovation is happening so obviously you'll see more content around it Neha, you've had a really, really great year at Risk Check. Austin is super happy with uh, the editorial you've put out and he said you can have any watch of, out of the, the current, you know, site catalogue. What are you mm-hmm. taking home? Would that be just one? <laughs> just okay, one. we've got two. We've got one where money is no ob- object and two, uh-huh. money is an object so, you know, it has to be realistic. It can't be an FP genre. Oh, no, I was about to say that. That could be the first one. You can have an FP Jean as uh, the, the money is no object. Okay. But you've got to have a more okay. realistic one too. Um, okay, I'll go with the FP Jean, uh, money is no object. And then um, I have a couple of others on my list. I mind them. Um, the Pedic Philippe, uh, Perpetual Calendar, Salmon Dial. Um, I actually have a couple of them on my mind uh, but they, those are not here those are austin's personal collection and <laughs> that, that might be pushing it a bit much uh yeah, pinching yeah. the boss's personal watch yeah but but i like the salmon dial pop gal and um the chocolate uh day date 36 mm in the current collection i even mm. like daytona's um yeah i think i should stop at that I mean, so basically, yeah. Austin, she's flexible. <laughs> <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, what was next? Sorry, I had to go into a, a different bit. And one other question that I was sort of wondering about from your, I don't know if you're across this sort of sales side of it. There's mm-hmm. been a lot of talk that I think um, uh, in the secondary market around mm-hmm. softening of prices of those sort of key you know, sort of blue chip brands and particular models. Is that something that 
that you're seeing uh, at your point of view or is that more affecting that sort of the speculators? You mean um, are we seeing that at risk check, uh, risk check as well? Yeah, like are you are you concerned about that or is that something you have sort of have to factor in or are you just, you know, business unusual and you know what your margins are and you work to that? We have seen a correction of prices and it's not really been a concern. I even did a market check piece on why it's the best time to buy watches um, and where Austin correctly said that, you know, this this had to happen. Uh, there has been a drop in prices, but it's not so drastic that, you know, if I want to buy um, a 15 to or two today, I can just uh, go to a shop and, you know, swipe my credit card. It's it's not dropped to that level. So, uh, yeah, there have been price corrections, Rolex 10%, Vacheron, Nil, AP 6%, and, uh, you know, Patek around 10, 9 again. So, yeah, uh, there has been a correction, but we'll have to wait and watch how it goes uh, in the next few months. Uh, Rolex is still seeing some drop in prices, but it really uh, hasn't affected sales at risk check, so to say. We are we, we don't buy inventories. We are into consignment. And uh, so, you know, it, it doesn't affect our uh, mm. Uh, as, as much as it does other dealers who actually buy inventories and, you know, have them there and they need to push out watches and at a certain price. And so it's it's quite transparent how we work. It is interesting. It's sort of, you know, we're hearing that from quite a few dealers that we chat to around that, that consignment model and that sort of, you know, I guess it gives a, a pretty true um, evaluation on what market price is and people sort of, actually, you know, sacrifice more in the end in terms of margin and, and, and whatnot. Uh, now, I don't know if Felix has, has, has told you um, or if you've, you've listened before, but at the end of an episode, we like to ask our guests for a recommendation. It could be absolutely anything, um, Netflix, audiobook, physical book, uh, podcast, whatever you've been doing, you've been enjoying that you think uh, whoever's listening right now will, um, might enjoy. Netflix is, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's like um, getting more like, you know, your mainstream watch publication, <laughs> doling out content uh, day after day, week after week. So I wouldn't say I've liked something uh, particularly, which I would like to recommend. Um, but uh, books, I have actually not had the time to um go through any books recently but I think I'm getting into podcasts I was uh, listening to your your episode with the uh, Ikipod uh, Ikipod CEO I like that and then I've been tuning into the waiting list podcast as well uh, a couple of interesting episodes there so I think it's it's my new thing um, I think everybody should just uh, tune into podcasts while they are on their way to office or whenever they have the time. It just gives you um, a different perspective on things and it's it's you don't have to read through it. So you, you can just plug in your AirPods and just, uh, you know, enjoy the talk, enjoy the chat. And uh, I, I find them very entertaining. So I'd say... Yeah. People should tune into OT podcast. This is, I, I, I think I, I have to say, this is perhaps the best recommendation of all time because <laughs> you're recommending us. Uh, that's great. And 100% the chat with Christian Louis Cole was a good mm -hmm. one, and the waiting list are uh, lovely people. Great uh, Neha, thank you so much for your time out of your day. I know it's very, very busy. Um, always good to chat to you, even better when we're recording it. And we will link up risk check, link up some of your articles and all the other stuff. But Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Felix, and thank you, Andy. And uh, thank you for having me here. It's lovely to just take a break from the usual humdrum and, you know, just generally chat about what's happening in the industry. I look forward to hearing myself again. <laughs> <laughs> we'll okay, see you thanks. later. Felix, I'm gonna just, uh, you have great tasting colleagues. Uh, sometimes. Mm. Mm. Every single one that I've... We uh, used to be colleagues. Uh, we probably still are. I guess, yeah, technically we are. <laughs> <laughs> you get the joke now. You get the joke. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Niha, for coming on. Always, always cool to kind of to chat to other peers, but also kind of gain a different perspective. And sure, sure, sure. from someone doing a bit of a different take on on watches, different lens. That's what I like, Felix. And uh, wrist check, doing great things. Check them out. We'll link them up in the show notes. Uh, yeah. You've been running there for a while now. We had Austin, Austin Chu, the founder, on maybe, blah, I don't know, a early, long time ago. Early last year, I think. It'll, it's all a blur, but he's he's doing great things and that business has grown a lot. So congrats to Austin. Uh, if you want to email us, ot at the podcast at gmail.com. What is our Instagram, Felix? I don't know, ot.podcasts. Yeah, like make that. sure you give me us a five-star review, um, telling your friends telling your uh, colleagues about us if they say hey yeah, I'm thinking about this watch link them our podcast and maybe an Adam Straps link sure do we do will uh, we'll will, we will see you next week we're not going to take a week off next, next week we will see you next week we will definitely 100% definitely yeah. never ever see you, see you.